JC Direct this week, the looming commodity cliff, golden oil, both telling a story. SARS gets an extra 10 billion and best and worst ETFs in the first quarter of 2024. Hello and welcome to JC Direct, episode 581 for 4 April. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. So let's kick off first with that uh, gold and oil story. And I've touched on it a bunch, but I'm keeping an eye on it because, well, it remains important. Brent is certainly trending higher, trading up at $89 and change as I record this on Wednesday midday. We can see the channels. It's at a resistance point right now. Uh, and then as it goes through, the next resistance is around 95 to about $100 a barrel. Now, now the move in oil is interesting because this is essentially saying to us, it's a demand story, but it's also in part supply. So we're getting supply out of Russia, no problem with that, where we're not getting supply so much as Saudi Arabia. OPEC Plus has tried to pull back on production to push that price higher. We've got North America, with the US in particular, fairly strongish economy, but Western Europe not looking pretty at all. Japanese demand not bad, China middling along at about 5% GDP, but we said it before, oil is potentially inflationary. There is very little that we consume at source of production, so we need to travel from A to B. For consumers, obviously, we need to move around, get to work. For lower-income consumers, uh, transport is a larger slice of their pay. So this is the concern. And I've spoken around inflation. I spoke around how what we're seeing, particularly in the U.S., Inflation's pretty much gone sideways since June of last year. Our own inflation, the governor MPC last week says they don't expect it back at that 4.5% until the end of next year. The risks to inflation locally and globally are to the upside. So then if we look at gold in and of itself, what is gold telling us? Well, gold's telling us a simple story, trading up at all-time highs, and gold is saying, yep, we're worried about inflation. That's why we have gold trading on this chart, 2,270. Different spots, the main spot price is above 2,300. The gold price is saying that it is worried about inflation, that it's not convinced inflation is over. And I think that's a fair shout. I'm not convinced inflation is over either. Now, not necessarily that inflation is going to be moving a whole lot higher. That might not necessarily be happening, but what's the catalyst here to start pushing inflation lower in an environment where energy costs are increasing? That is the big issue. If energy is going up, well, then inflation is not coming roaring down. And we're looking currently for the U.S. Federal Reserve FOMC committee to do a June rate cut. Uh, our governor himself said, look, we're going to have less cuts and we're going to start later. June might be off the table. I think we're going to want to, not we, I think the central bankers around the world are going to want a really good sense that things are happening and that they are confident enough to start to say, you know what, fair enough, the inflation is beaten. You don't want to cut rates and then have to rise them again. Rather wait a bit because you can get a little bit fast on the way down. You can do bigger cuts. You can do it more regularly. But that inflation, not yet over. So yesterday, Goldfields announced that their Chilean mine was going to be doing up and producing. It's a great mine. In the first year, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, all in costs are a little bit chunky, around $1,700, $1,800 an ounce. Uh, but by next year, that will start coming down to $790 sorry, to $820 an ounce. That is really, really cheap. And a good, good, good quantum of gold coming out of the ground there as well. Uh, it was over cost. It ended up costing costing a, a billion dollars and change. Initially, it was supposed to cost some $800 million. Uh, and uh, yeah, so about 50% over cost. Not a real surprise. What really struck out for me, took 13 years from discovery to production. 13 years. And think about it. How many new mines have we seen getting their production coming and going? And the answer is not very many. I d I, I'm trying to do some digging. Uh, in the last uh, period between 2002 and 2023, 127 new mines opened around the world. Most of those in gold, uh, then nickel, 
non-precious, no PGMs whatsoever on that list. Uh, expected time for those 127 mines from discovery to production, almost 16 years, which means if we're starting to worry about uh, supply, we're worrying about supply in 16 years' time in many senses. I'll come back to that more in a moment. Almost 400 new mines needed just for future EV battery demand. Now, that number might be inflated by two. You know, maybe it's only 200 new mines. Maybe EVs aren't as big as everyone thinks they're going to be. But here's the thing. Even if it's only 100 mines, it's going to take pretty much 20 years to get those 100 mines going if we start now. So what's the issue here? The issue is a commodity cliff is looming. And what I mean by that is mines are getting older, they get shuttered because they're no longer economic or because they've been mined out, but there's not new supply coming on the other side. We can solve for this a couple of ways. Firstly, we carry on mining, right? Okay, so that does work. But remember, a miner starts with their cheap mining production, and as they move to the other seams, it gets more and more expensive. But that kind of balances itself, right? If we're seeing that demand not being met by supply, then prices edge higher, then those more expensive parts of the mines are certainly viable, whereas perhaps previously they hadn't been viable. So there is a point that says, okay, that balance kind of sits in, in, in the equation. We also, I think, can expect to start to see more acquisitions. So you're a mining company of whatever ilk, and you're like, hmm, my production is running out. Let me go buy somebody else. But that doesn't change anything, right? That's just moving the chairs in the deck of the, of the Titanic. That is not actually making new production. It's that new production we haven't seen. I've been chatting with Wayne McCurry about this. Uh, he, of course, from F&B Wealth and Investments forever in a day. And the story is that in the last decade or even more, there's just been practically no new development. A couple of reasons. One, pricing, uh, legislation, regulation to get it done, not just in South Africa. You know, opening a mine in Chile, used to regulation used to be about six months. Now it's up to three to five years. So it's taking a lot longer to get that regulation going. Uh, the mining companies are scared of doing it. Massive costs overrun. I mean, remember Vale for uh, Anglo-American, their Brazilian mine, uh, mining iron ore. Way over budget, way over time. And one of the last really, really big ones that have come online. So what we're getting is less coming, and therefore, where are these commodities going to be supplied from? The short answer is you're probably facing pricing pressure to the upside, quite simply, as supply struggles to meet that demand. In some cases, it's not so bad. Uranium, certainly we're seeing a fair bunch of uranium coming on. Coal, Often cases easier because it's more or less surface mining. In most cases, it's just not viable to go very deep. Ditto for iron ore. But again, we saw that Vale mine in, in, in Brazil and how that managed to go over budget, over time, over cost, over everything to get it back into production. There certainly are real challenges coming, and it's not in the immediate. It's going to roll out over the next decade or two or maybe three, and the mining industry might suddenly see this and think to themselves, cool, we've got a problem, let's solve it. But as I said, they don't like new mines. They're expensive, they're risky, shareholders get no return for those 13, 15, 20 years while you're putting the mine together, but you're creating a vast amount of cost along there. Likely it's going to be over budget and cash terms. Likely it will take longer than expected. So something to keep an eye on. This is not a short-term issue. This is a medium to long-term, but it is a real issue. Make no mistake about that. We had data out for SARS. Uh, they talking around their collections. I need to read these stats because there's bunches of them. So they got an extra 10 billion rand in, in, in tax receipts, which sounds lacquer, except put it in perspective, uh, they got 1.7 trillion rand in total taxes. So 10 billion is tiny. And the, the tax windfall from when commodities were booming back in 2021, 2022, was 150 billion. So not a heck of a lot. Company tax was down 9% at 317 billion. Individuals was up 8.2% at 651 billion rand. And VAT was up 6% at 447 billion rand. And then, of course, there's others. There's fuel levies, exercise duties, and all the rest. But this does 
tell a bit of a story. And the story is company tax down 9%. Now, some of that is going to be the miners, particularly the PGM, not so much gold, but the PGM miners, coal, iron ore to a degree, they were so struggling. But some of it is the likes of the pick and pays. I mean, we've seen results coming through and they have been tough, very, very tough. So they simply make less money uh, and pay less tax. Some of that less money is ShopRite. Remember, spending one billion rand a year on diesel. Now, we haven't had load shedding in, is it a week? I don't know. It's been a while since load shedding. So ShopRite is saving some cash. But let's make no mistake, that is short term. Load shedding isn't gone away. Load shedding is just taking a long Easter weekend break. And then uh, best performing ETFs on the JSC. So I look at this uh, year-end one is, is lots of fun, but then I do the, the quarter-end one as well, uh, and we'll go have a look at those. And, and some, some good numbers, although no real surprises here. Let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, yes, there it is. So this is just for first quarter. It is total return. Top performing ETF for the quarter, the one. The one invest infotech index feeder uh, etf 5 it it was by 100 miles the top performing etf last year and it's clocked in at 15 percent for the first half of first quarter of this year i'm ignoring for now the actively managed because the signia actively managed etf fang ai actually did slightly better i, I need to make a, a a decision here do i consider i mean they are technically etfs in terms of how they trade and where they trade, but they're active, not passive. And, and so I need to decide. Maybe, maybe I just need to put them in a separate bucket uh, with all the AMCs and the like, actively managed certificates. Uh, second up was Japan. Japan, as we've spoken around in this very podcast, Abenomics has worked. Japan did 13.91. Then we've got some S&P 500. We've got the euro up at 12.9, also from Signia. Uh, no real surprising ones here. MSCI USA doing well, uh, Satrix MSCI World doing well, and the One Invest MSCI World also doing well. Short answer, offshore. On that entire top 10 list, there is no local ETF. They all listed local, but none of them are covering local assets. And then we scroll down to the losers. Top of the losing pile is the Satrix Divi Plus down 9.4% so far in the first quarter. That was total return. There's a thing in understanding how this Divi Plus works. It uses a forward dividend yield. So it looks at a stock and it says, what do the analysts expect the dividend yield to be for the next year? Takes the best 30, pops them into an ETF. But those dividend yields can fall if things don't quite work out. Our next take, Thungela. Great dividend yield, but if the, the, the price of, of coal suddenly dropped to uh, $20 a ton from the current $120 a ton, well, their profits go to negative and the share price gets hit. So that's what's been happening. Some of these stocks with great forward dividends are seeing the share prices being hit, notwithstanding they're still paying dividends. And of course, if the dividends remain in place and the share price comes down, that dividend yield almost gets better. In many ways, these are contrarian ETF in the Satrix Divi Plus. Uh, the other one that's dominated is Platinum and Palladium. Uh, no real surprises there. What is a surprise, because I got the five-year KGARs there as well, compound annual growth rate, is that Palladium is negative KGAR over five years. If you've held Palladium for five years, you have lost money. The Satrix Finney's in there as well, down 7.09%. Doesn't surprise me. First podcast of this year, we did our prediction show with uh, Mark Ashton and Keith McLaughlin, and I said Finney, negative for the year. And that includes a very chunky dividend yield as well. The ETF, uh, FNB mid-cap ETF, down 3.3%. That's not massively surprising either. Uh, the mid-cap is very much SA Inc. So you expect that SA Inc. is struggling. Satrix Quality South Africa also under pressure. So not much fun there in terms of the losers, but the winners doing really, really well. And if we look at those 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 KGARs, five-year KGAR on the Infotech from One Invest, 32%. KGARs above 20% include the S&P 500, uh, no surprises there, and uh, the MSCI USA World. But the other KGARs are even 15 and above, solid returns. Helped in part, not so much this year, but helped in part generally by, quite frankly, the RAND, because, of course, 
they are offshore. But no surprises to anyone that it is the global markets, most notably Infotech, that is doing well, while the local are not doing great at all. So we've got uh, two events coming up. One is on the 18th of April. That is a 5.30 p.m. getting started in shares. Uh, it is a live event as well as a webcast live event is at Rosebank in uh, in Rosebank, Johannesburg. I always say Johannesburg because, of course, there's other Rosebanks, most notably Cape Town, at the Standard Bank head office in 30 Baker Street. It's getting started in shares. You can attend the webcast. You can attend live if you want. And then the week after, the Tuesday, uh, 23rd at 11, I'm going to be chatting with one investor. I'm going to be talking about their offshore, their infotech. What makes that infotech ETF so very different and, truthfully, so very better than the other uh, it's sort of tech NASDAQ ETFs out there? We'll get a sense of those as well. JustOneLap.com slash events for booking and more information. We'll leave this week's webcast, your podcast here now. Uh, as always, my name is Simon. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. If you enjoy the, the podcast, please leave us an excellent rating in your podcatcher of choice or a review. The reviews kind of fall off. This podcast is uh, 14, 13 years old. So we kind of get lost a bit, but new reviews certainly help. And we'll chat again next week. Until then, as always, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.